All right, Kalani, I want to welcome you to the show today. Hey, how are you? All right, so let me do a little introduction just so I can let all of my listeners know who, who you are, and, and then we can jump into j- jump into the show. So, uh, so Kalani it, Thomas is the CEO of Kiba. I pronounced that right, correct? Yes, sir. All of them. Now, how did you how did you come up with the name Kiba? Uh, so the first uh, six employees in the company's initials are K I H B B A. So we put them all in a pot and scrambled them together to come up with a cool company name to try to give everybody that initial interest in ownership and equity in the company. And it uh, worked out pretty well, came out with a funky sounding tech name. So we just stuck with it. <laughs> I love it. That's great. And so you help uh, small to medium businesses streamline workflows via their top SaaS automation tools via, uh, through integrate, integrating them. And you've sold over $150 million in products and services to business throughout your career. And if unique to unique, you've unique, you've come up with a unique skill set with sales. And you've surrounded yourself with some great, great technical talent to help pull off your vision of connecting SaaS um, tools and, and developing automations between those, those applications for, for uh, companies. Right. I always considered myself as a good salesperson, someone who had that go, go gadget mentality of being able to deploy different systems to do different things, to get different types of attention from people. And when I wanted to start a tech company it was for that same thing. How do we reach out to sales teams, marketing teams, and give them the click of a button access to enable them to just be better and faster at what they do. So, uh, so this is great. This is a very much a serendipi- serendipity how we got connected, but I, it's a very powerful connection because the big theme for our, my CIO innovation group this year is CIOs are the API of the business, which, mm-hmm. which from a human perspective, the CIO now, their, their leadership uh, has, to, has to 10X, meaning they have to work with all, ang- all um, parts of the business because technology is ubiquitous across the entire, the entire business. So it's a very, very powerful enabler. Right. And but in the same, but I like I like the play on words because there's a human API, but then there's also the system side, and and we got connected because uh, we had I was having some challenges with LinkedIn. We we're doing some very uh, uh, forward facing stuff on LinkedIn, and the coach I was working mm-hmm. with connected us together because I needed to pull some some data points out of LinkedIn and have them automated within a, a pipe drive platform, and then also have them connected to our active uh, campaign CRM uh, uh, systems as well. And so we got connected to right. your team and, th- and that's been great. Uh, where, where do you see, where do you see, how important do you feel uh, developing relationships and automations between uh, SaaS providers is for, for companies these days? So I find, I find that it really enables a team or a company to work differently. Companies that don't choose the right tools, that don't have these API connections in place and stuff like that, they tend to run the business and then they they chase around their technology to make sure their technology is keeping up. And when a company has that stuff in place, has those integrations, has those automations and systems all talk to each other, they run the business and the technology follows them along. And so it's a difference in how you're able to structure the company, run the company, expedite all those different processes and things you do, because you're not having to worry about how much follow-up are we going to have to do with these systems and tools that we put in place for our teams to use. Yeah. And I, I've, one of the big ways I I try to push the group uh, each month is to develop offense capabilities and to help help their businesses develop offense. And some of the things we're talking about with these APIs and developing these connections between systems, there is, um, you're not gonna get that out of your marketing team. I mean, this is so not in my, I mean, my marketing team knows what's going on, but uh, I I have to get people to really know how to develop, they gotta understand the process. This is where my marketing team plays out. They can understand the process, but they're not the ones that are facilitating the automations uh, behind the scenes. Do you right. find that often with happening? I, I find that to be true as well as when someone is an internal expert or someone on a marketing team knows a piece of software, they typically know that piece of software and that's it, right? So they don't know how it best plays with the other tools that are in place. They don't know whether or not 
the other tools that are in place can do something better, faster, or easier. They just know that one tool that they know. And so one of those things that we try to focus on with our clients is making sure they're on the right tools from the get-go, but then making sure they understand how to manipulate those tools and get what they want out of them in as easy as possible and go to the right part of their tech stack to do so. So when we find that people are trying to do that internally, it's typically a, a limited amount of knowledge, which is very common in any API or connection or integration is just what's possible. That, that seems to be something that comes up all the time is what can we even do? And then when you learn, it's often from a fire hose. So it's difficult to figure out exactly what you want to stick and make work for the business. Yeah, that's a great point on what is possible. Um, I think uh, when I was having some initial conversations, I knew what I wanted to accomplish, but I didn't know what was possible. That's a great one, what's right. possible. And I knew I had Asana and that I had some great talent on Asana. I knew that I had uh, LinkedIn, knew what I was doing there, and I knew what the problems were there, and I knew what was going on with my CRM. But but how, and, and, and do I even want to have these systems communicating one another? I, um, I mean, a perfect example of, of it was, you know, there, I, you can use DocuSign to automate and sign a contract. However, that I, from talking to you, I realized that, that once that hit, we actually have the API connector for this DocuSign uh, system that could actually trigger the actual pipe drive uh, to say that this has been signed versus having to go out and check that, that uh, site and check this site and check this site. Mm -hmm. And I found that, that that's the type of thinking that is, that is really needed these days. Yeah, and you know, the, the interesting thing about information going back and forth between these tools and something we see all the time is people initially come to us and they say, hey, we want this information super highway between these tools, right? That when anything happens over here, we want it to happen over here. And what we oftentimes end up talking to them about is what you actually want is you want these wormholes and these little portals from one part of your system to the other uh, because it's, as the saying goes, right, data in, data out, the garbage in, garbage out, it's the same scenario. And so if you've got lots of people on the team and not everybody's consistent in how they use the tools and everything goes everywhere, then you have inconsistencies that go all over the place. Whereas if you can build these great little portals and wormholes and things that connect just what needs to be connected exactly when it needs to be connected, you end up eliminating a lot of that waste and that clutter and that moving of data that just really doesn't need to be done. It makes it much easier for you to be able to connect systems the right way and not tax your automation engines or tools like Zapier or things like that. So do you find, you use the word uh, portal and, and, and wormholes, is, is, is that a... What, what skill is that of being able to say what's actually necessary versus just ta turning the entire uh, flood over? Because I, this is a perfect example because you, you and I were talking about this. There is a tool, I'm going to point on LinkedIn because a lot of the folks listening are like, oh, that's a, that's a marketing job and that's a sales VP job. I, I, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, there's talent in every position in a business, but the it doesn't mean that they actually understand what's happening between these systems. And, right. and, and so we had this bulk tool that we were using, I think it was duck soup. And I didn't mm -hmm. realize that that was doing a bulk upload and shift right into my uh, pipeline, my, my pre CRM system pre. And then talking to you, I realized there's like 14 other vendors that can actually do a more discrete pulls of that data. Yeah. And it's just, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Duck soup is one of those, every single thing that happens there goes into your CRM. It's very difficult to sort of narrow it down. And even the options that are in there are great, great tool works for what it works for. But then as uh, I think Peter Thiel put it in his book, right? That zero to one is very different than that end to one business, right? Someone looks at duck soup and says, I can build it better. And then someone looks at that company and says, I can build it better. And six, seven months after something's hit the market, there's 10 different competitors that have all added or subtracted one thing from the business to make the tool slightly better for slightly less money with slightly less brand name than all these other companies. So we, we have put ourselves in a position to try to get as many of those companies as possible to reach out to us and say, hey, we're a new software company. 
Uh, we want to build a good support arm, but we know we're not going to have the resources to do it because we're still tiny. So can we just send stuff to you? And when we can get those types of relationships put in place, that's what gives us the knowledge to say, hey, I know you're using DuckSoup, but there's uh, lead jet and there's these different things to do what that does without it being a full every single thing happens every single time sort of system, which is just really good for managing all sorts of problems that can come up with duplications and uh, following things that have been deleting things, marking things in the wrong files, all sorts of stuff happens when you're collecting everything. So what type of, and we come into more of the, the, the governance side on the red zone side, we were often, just because data is in one system doesn't mean that it's supposed to be in another system. Um, and that can become, that can become a challenge in and of itself of making sure that we want data leaving a certain system to go into another. Um, but I, I'm curious for you, from your perspective, what skills needed on wh what teams do you work with the best from a talent perspective? Like where, where do companies need to have, what type of talent do they, should they be trying to have on their own teams? So the teams we work the most often with are sales and business development teams, hand down. And the main reason why is because that's ever changing, right? It's a new season, it's a new campaign, it's a new strategy, it's a new list, it's a new something. And so the amount of back-end and front-end technology use that needs to happen is just really large for a lot of companies. Um, a perfect example of that, and I don't want to start using acronyms that could possibly bore people, but long story short, AT&T is putting in a brand new process where starting April 1st, you need to register your business if you send text messages to your clients and those clients happen to be AT&T customers. So now all of a sudden, there's a fee you have to pay to register your business, a monthly fee you have to pay to be able to do it. And if you're not registered by June, you can start to get blocked, right? So that type of stuff right now affects sales teams and marketing teams more than anybody else. There's very few service teams that are sending out blast email and text message campaigns, right? So sales teams right now, as soon as they started getting those alerts, our inboxes here were flooded with what is this A2P 10 DLC thing? And can you tell us what it means for us? So sales teams have more of a need, so they tend to reach out to us more. And because they're closely connected with marketing teams internally, the marketing team typically sees what we're doing and says, hey, uh, let us get that number as well. And then we end up working with the marketing team too. So you end up being the, the, the heavyweights behind uh, those teams so that you can pull these connectors together and, and making sure that the sales, the CRM system and the marketing automation system and the project management system that are rel related to this, that are all talking to one another correctly. Is that all correct? All talking to each other and doing what they need to do and making sure that, uh, right, you don't need all your sales team in your QuickBooks account, but you might need to send invoices from each of your salespeople, right? So building those connections that salespeople can click a button or two and automate using tools and systems that they don't need to have access to for the same reason we talked about of, they don't need all the data all the time. So being able to uh, take and put that stuff together for people is really important. Yeah, yeah, it, it for sure is. So um, I've, I've found, um, you know, it's, I find it's easier to work with a, with a team like yours when, when I have someone on my team that, that has some skills in, in different areas so that we can ingest that capability into the team and use you to go deploy to fix something else that that to me has been so like having project management internally is really helpful because then it, it makes it more efficient for the external team to work as well as the internal team and then if i don't have the ability to, to ingest that knowledge that i'm being taught between systems and then i can never move on to the next challenge that might be the next layering capability that's needed mm -hmm. there's a pretty good amount of people that hire us and one of the first things we do with them is actually teach them how to use the tools they've already purchased. So people will literally come to us being a two year user of like pipedrive.com or monday.com or something like that. And we'll take on a project and we'll notice that the only thing they've ever done is load contacts into the system. They're basically using it as a fancy digital contact card, right? So we'll have to, okay, get the whole team back on and say, hey, everything you think you thought you wanted 
probably not right. Like, let's teach you how this tool works. Let's show you what this tool actually does. Then let's reevaluate. And every single time we do that, people are blown away with this, like, wow, I had no idea I could do all of that. Well, if it can do all of that, then everything we want has changed. Uh, give us another day or two and we'll come back to you. And so it's, it's funny, we've even found ourselves in scenarios where we almost take for granted because the company's had a tool for so long that they probably already know how to use the tool and come to find out it's something they've had that they've been paying for that no one's logged into until 20 minutes before the call with us and they've never even seen it. So it's, uh, it's interesting to, to make sure that we're always parsing that knowledge through to say, well, here's what the tool actually does. And then contrary to that, making sure the team here knows the same thing as well. So we have a daily standup with our tech team every day where anything that's new and unique that they've done for the first time that day, we share it with everybody else on the team. So everybody else knows, oh, that's cool. We didn't know that tool could do that too. Now everybody has that knowledge. And then that stuff gets communicated and shared in a special Slack channel and stuff like that as well. So the knowledge behind what these tools can do, how they can do it, and what's the most efficient way to do it is the biggest part of being in this world is just staying as educated as possible. And so it's a, it's a big part of it to, to pass that knowledge on, to possess that knowledge. It's, it's everything when it comes to doing this correctly. Now, what about overlapping? Uh, how problematic is it for some of the systems with overlapping functions? Like a, a system has, you need, you need the 10 pieces of functionality, but you got systems that have like overlapping capabilities. How do you decide which system you're going to use versus another mm -hmm. for making those decision points? So we typically look at overlapping dollars as well. So a great example of this is, and I'm going to come back to pipe drive often because it's, uh, it's the tool we've got the most experience and we've done more than a thousand pipe drive projects. So we're familiar with that tool very well. So that tool has its own scheduling component directly in it. Um, most pipe drive users are on this mid tier level where if you use that scheduling component, you only have access to one type of meeting. So you can build one 30 minute meeting for yourself, something like that. You can label it meeting and that's it, right? To get access to unlimited numbers of meetings where you can build them all for your own, customize them all to do all that stuff, you need to pay an additional $30 a month to Pipedrive to get to that next tier to unlock those extra features. So can that tool do all of that stuff together, absolutely, but you're paying $15, $20 more a month than you would almost any other scheduled tool on the market that's native to just being a scheduling tool like Calendly or something like that. So when it comes to you're a one-person company, you've got a tool like Pipedrive that can do everything, sure. Eat that extra 15 or 20 bucks a month so it's all in one platform. But when you've got 10, 15, 20 salespeople, that you're doing this with and that's you know 30 bucks a month times 20 people you know it makes a lot more sense to spend 200 over 600 and have your overlapping dollars be what's really qualifying whether or not a feature should or shouldn't exist in your stack with that tool um, with that being said we do a lot of teardowns where people are coming to us with uh, <laughs> I had a client say this earlier on the phone and I wrote it down. So I was like, I'm absolutely going to do that. He's like, where they have these systems that are these power drills that are showing up to thumbtack convention. And I was like, yeah. So I was like, that's very much it where it's a, a one person cupcake shop uh, that's got an enterprise account for Salesforce for some reason. And you're like, what are you doing? Like there's no need for that level of technology in your business. Like you can trim it way back and there's tools that are cheaper and better and different. So for us, it's always about that. It's what, what dollars overlapped and then how hard is it to adopt that strategy that we're going to implement or we're going to suggest because it doesn't matter how much money you're saving or spending. If you're not using it, it's irrelevant anyways. Yeah. So that, you know, this, this, this analysis of SAS of all of your SAS tools is, is a big, is a big deal. Um, and for, mm -hmm. for, I, for, I think what it what it is is it requires clarity and it requires less sloppy sloppy thinking. Uh, what I've noticed with my own uh, journey down optimizing our SaaS inter interactions, especially within our marketing and our and our sales groups, uh, it, the the required clarity of thought and and really really demanding less sloppy. Uh, approach to what the outcome is because marketing and sales tends to piss off IT departments a lot 
because they're required <laughs> to go fast. Like uh, the marketing and sales groups, they're, they're changing very, very frequently, but, it, but there is a lot of things that are standard or can be standardized and, and you can free the creativity up, but the, the whole thing can't be sloppy and can't be just a moving target. And so I do find that behind the scenes, we found it, re it required us to really settle down and, and say, how do we want these systems interacting with one another to achieve the outcome? Um, so do you, do you find that that's a, a, a common mistake that companies are making? Yeah, we even, to, to further that analogy, right? We think about it a lot like, do you remember when you were a kid and you used to set up dominoes so they'd fall down? You didn't play dominoes, right? You did that, um, right? You quickly learn after a period of time that if you get your spacing right and your angles right and you get all that stuff just perfect, when you hit that first domino, you get that really satisfying, oh, everything fell, it turned the right corner, it knocked over your race car, right? It did all those right things. And so everyone has that, that, that mental image of doing that. And when you're not thinking about it and you just set up these dominoes and then you go, Hey, that one needs to turn the corner and you just shove seven more of them in there. Cause you think it's going to work. You end up with something that doesn't work or doesn't work consistently or to your point looks sloppy. And uh, we'll see that we'll see clients that come in and they go, you know, Hey, well, six months ago, we started sending text messages and then we found out about ringless voicemails. So we added that in and then we started doing this uh, email drop as well. And so the very first time someone hits their website, uh, you look like that crazy significant other waiting for them at their locker after they get out of class with a voicemail and a text message and an email and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, you, you've overcompensated. You tried to build something that was efficient for the customer. And now you're giving them this, you know, behind door A, we can text behind door B, we can call. And it's just sometimes it's too much. So thinking about projects methodically of even with customers, and we might've even have done it with you of, Hey, Let's stop thinking right now and let's go build it. Because once you see it and you can touch it, and you can say, hey, those dominoes should be a little closer together. Those angles should be a little different. And then let's watch it happen again and watch it happen again. And okay, we like that. Let's add something else in there and see what happens. You end up with this much better, more smooth, more predictable way of your integrations and systems doing the things you intended them to do when you sat down to play with your dominoes for the first time. You know, it's it's an interesting metaphor. I, there's a great book um, out by Keith Ferrazzi that I listened to him speak about 25 years ago. And he's talking about this concept right now of a Lego block workforce, where I like the analogy because uh, as people are working from home and, and we're using these really smart systems, some of the systems can be automated and the process automated, but really you've got to break down the role of each human being and say, okay, what, what's the Lego block that makes up that particular function. What's the Lego block for this function? What's the Lego block for this? Mm -hmm. So if we're not pushing spreadsheets, what are we actually pushing? What do we actually want to replicate in the system and, and then move it? So for example, in uh, LinkedIn, you know, we bench, five years ago, we were doing a lot of this management in a spreadsheet and then Active Campaign came out with some, not Active Campaign, but uh, Sales Navigator came out with some ways to do list management. Mm -hmm but you couldn't do workflow and process flow on, on uh, an act in uh, sales navigator. So then you start, then you start looking at pulling that data out into a system that can do that because it used to be human beings just moving data and having to think. And so it really is, it takes a real discriminating mindset to just break these into blocks. And, uh, and, and I can't say that I'm great at it. I can identify the problem, but I found that it, I actually even need like, more deeper thinkers on my team and externally like you guys to figure this out. Um, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> have you, uh, um, have you ever put together a jigsaw puzzle? Are you a jigsaw puzzle guy? I certainly have done it before. I can't say I'm a jigsaw puzzle <laughs> guy, but, it, but um, okay. it takes way too much patience for me to so, do a lot of them, but I do like them. So I'll continue with the metaphor because this is often what we find people are is, if you've ever sat down, you put together a jigsaw puzzle, you eventually get to that point where, you know, you're sitting there and you've got the box top in one hand and you're looking at the piece that you need to work on. And you got two other pieces in your hand, you're fiddling around. And then sure enough, right. Someone else comes in fresh, just sits down at the table and they just start picking up pieces and snapping them in, snapping them in, snapping them in, snapping them in. And everybody almost gets to this point where they're like, Hey, leave my puzzle alone. Like I've been sitting here for two hours working on this. Like I'm working yes. on this corner. Like I knew those went there, but I wasn't getting to those yet. I'm working on my corner. And that, that puzzle 
analogy is what we find a lot of companies come to us with where they're like, hey, here's this problem I have is this right here. And I've been holding this top and looking at this piece and I've been yep. looking at it for two weeks and I'm fed up and I need someone to help me. And then we come in and we go, hey, well, that's not even the part of the picture that completes what we're doing here. Like we got to get the frame in place and we got to do this and that. And we start to snap those pieces in and they go, oh, so let me step back. Let me look at it holistically. Let me let puzzle experts put it together. And when we do that, we pull people away from being so close to it that they can't see what they're even looking at anymore. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a huge point. I think sometimes um, deep expertise is, a, is, is actually the problem. And mm -hmm. there's yeah, a or, or finite expertise even, right? Really just knowing one area really well and going, well, I know we can do it in QuickBooks. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to scour Google and find the right forum. And I know this is the third YouTube video I've watched to make it work, but I promise it's in here somewhere, right? Like that type of finite expertise where you only want to know one system or only can, that can really get you in trouble too. Yeah, that's a really good point. Cause I recently just hired uh, some, ex well, external project, external project management uh, expertise, some internal uh, tech support to help with some of these with you guys. And mm -hmm. I found that that, that, second and third set of eyes uh, really helped create an acceleration in the problem solving because you can just be way too close to the problem. And, um, and, and that's, that's a, a great, great point. What, um, what yeah, do you we'll even, we even have our own technicians that sometimes forget that some of the things customers are asking for are just features that are in the tools they look for. And we'll start building secondary and third automations and then be able to realize, Oh, that's actually something that they've added in the last month or so. So we can just flip it on and it's not a problem anymore. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting problem. So what are your favorite, what are your favorite uh, tools to use in conjunction with LinkedIn right now? So in conjunction with LinkedIn, we do a lot of work with DuckSoup. Um, so I do like DuckSoup. I think it's good as far as um, DuckSoup goes. Uh, we've got uh, LeadJet currently in yep. place with our sales girl who sits in London, and she absolutely loves it and, quite frankly, is producing quite a bit more than some of our cold call only agents being able to use that tool in conjunction with her cold calls. Um, so that's a tool we're probably going to turn around and roll out everywhere. Um, the other thing that we're playing with quite a bit right now that creates really good content that goes out all over the place is Vidyard. And oh, I love Vidyard. Vidyard. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not LinkedIn specific by any means, but what it can do and the way it presents information and flexibility it gives you to share it anywhere like a LinkedIn directly in your feed as an expert and stuff like that. That's a really cool tool to be able to help get that thought leadership out there that, you know, all of us, look for from time to time when we need it. So uh, just explain what Vidyard is so that people know kind of what, what yeah. that is. So Vidyard is a way of taking information that you want to be able to share with people that's typically visual, um, like an online sales demo or a walkthrough of a website or something like that. And it gives you the opportunity to record your screen, record yourself, add great little uh, vignettes or picture in picture frames and stuff like that. Um, and then it takes that content and uh, produces it under a special URL and with special embed links and things like that. So you could put it in emails and share it in social media and post it to your website and do all sorts of great stuff with it. It's really inexpensive for what yeah. you get to do there as well, um, which is really great. There's a free plan even as well if you're not doing much with it. Um, if you want to do everything with it in the world, it can get up there. But for most people, it's less than like 20 bucks a month for a user. It's pretty great. Yeah, it's it's a, it's really interesting. If, you, if the people listening, you really want to surprise your your sales uh, VP and your marketing team, just mention Vidyard and you can share video directly in the native messaging within uh, with LinkedIn, which is uh, just such a unique way to differentiate someone. And then you can also... Uh, there's a press the record button and you can actually speak and leave a, uh, a, a, just a, a message a, a verbal message right in the LinkedIn feed too. Most people don't know that that's usually quite shocking for people to see that little stream come in when you're actually talking to someone versus writing them a message. Um, what yeah, we, uh, we, even with Vidyard are doing video newsletters, right? Just in an opportunity to try to change up how people see newsletters being shared with them and stuff like that. Right. If, uh, if I'm going to expect someone to, read it in two and a half minutes. Why not watch it for two and a half minutes? They're way more conditioned to do that in 2021. So uh, we're using it for as many things as we can. 
So this is the interesting part though, is I think this is where you come in and most people know is that someone has a clever idea like that. It's like a little bomb that goes off inside the sales manager's head and marketing because they never heard it. And then all of a sudden they're like, how do we do that? Well, we record a video and yada, yada, yada. But the thing is, it's not just about one person. How do you make Vidyard work with your sales automation, marketing automation, right. or your CRM? Like, yep. where would you lead someone next about how to, how to about that, that question? Yeah, so Vidyard is one of those tools that has an open API. And that's one of those things we look for. That's the, the first thing we do when someone says something to us, a, a new tool we don't know or anything like that is it gets dropped into Google with the word API attached to it. And and <laughs> even on, on sales calls and stuff, someone will say, well, hey, you know, we're using uh, M1 uh, project management software for manufacturers. Can you guys do anything with that? And sure enough, you know, M1 API, we find out Sage has bought them. We know Sage has an open API. So yep. yes, whatever you need, we can do, right? So, so that's always where it comes to. So what we um, would typically even do for people, because it's got a really great interface for it, is Zapier or Zapier, whatever you want to call it. Um, it has a great explore tool where you can actually put in two separate tools and it gives you a list of what these tools can do with each other. So anytime something happens here, you can do this thing and that other tool. So it gives you a really good idea of just one-to-one -one relationships of if you have a bid yard and a pipe drive, what yeah. can you make the two tools do together, which is typically where we'll tell people to go if they're just playing around and looking at what's possible and don't need an expert on the phone with them to figure it out. Well, so would you say Zapier would be like a third-party broker for APIs? Oh, man. Um, Zapier is hand down, Zapier is hand down the, my favorite tool, um, on the internet for anything. And I say that, and there's going to be other people that do integrations that listen to me who are like, oh no, Integromat's way better. Or we like automate IO or, or use it integrally or whatever it is. Right. Cause you know, same thing Zapier came out and then 25 other people came out right behind him and built the same thing. So, you know, but but I look at uh, the Zapier and Tegramat relationship a lot like Apple and PC almost, right? Where PCs are a little more customizable. You can kind of break up your mouse and buy different screens and do all that yeah, cool yeah. stuff with it. Whereas Apple, it all comes in a box, right? And so Zapier is that it all comes in a box. So for us, um, one of the things we really like about Zapier is we can use it to quantify our value to a client and what they've paid us for. So Zapier has this really cool... Uh, thing. And if you're watching this or listening to this right now and you have a Zapier account, go to zapier.com forward slash productivity dash calculator and then hit enter. And it'll wow. actually show you how many minutes you've saved having a Zapier account. Wow. And so we actually do that for our clients like once a quarter and send it over to them. And our client who won the award uh, this last quarter uh, had saved 125,000 minutes with Zapier in his business, which is just over 2000 hours of time, which is a full-time person that he had basically replaced with a $50 a month tool, which is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a powerful little tool. And, uh, and, and through working mm -hmm. with you guys, you know, I, there's a great book called exponential organizations. Have you, have you read it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, you have a long time ago. But yes. Okay. So do you know, they mentioned in there, APIs are the, uh, are, are the future for, for CIOs right in there. They said APIs are the king. So I, I've often sent that out as a, as a gift book. And then, and, uh, but I, I, that's the kind of, that's the kind of skill I believe that business leaders need to have, especially the business IT leader in conjunction with, with the marketing and the sales folks is they just have one person there that can dominate the uh, API and the brokerage between these third-party apps. And if they don't have it, they go to you. And, or I believe that you need to have that person who becomes more of the business process expert of that. And they have a company like you that basically you can charge forward on understanding more of the other products that aren't um, necessarily a part of that company's ecosystem, but can be there to help them solve problems. And I think that that's right. Right. And we, we even think about that we've got this interesting thing that's happening here where our salespeople and our account managers, they're on the phones with people all the time now and hearing these uh, cool things that systems can do, things they didn't know existed, stuff like that. So 
Um, yesterday, we had a huge partnership rollout here. We had about 200 new partners, all from one company uh, that are coming on with us all at the same time. <clears throat> and we promised them all we'd call them yesterday. And so we were waiting on this list all day long, all day long. Finally, 4.36 in the afternoon, we get this list. So no chance at all that we can call everybody. But my partner guy reaches out and goes, hey, wasn't there a tool we were talking about with someone a couple weeks ago that drops voicemails into people's inboxes? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, it's called Drop Cowboy or Slide Broadcast. There's these two different tools. So what's it called? So slide goes, Broadcaster? Slide Broadcaster? Yes, yeah, sl Slide Broadcast. And okay. then there's another one, which I like a little better, called Drop Cowboy. And so I was like, yeah, I was like, you know what? Good point. So we went out, acquired a Drop Cowboy account, took us about five minutes to sign up and get approved. And then took the list that we had got and recorded a voicemail that was, you know, hey, sorry, we missed the call. Um, yeah. You know, here's a, here's a little <laughs> voicemail from us. Give us a call back to the office if you still wanted to talk today. And uh, and then dropped it into everybody's voicemail by about 4.50 in the afternoon. So about 20 minutes after we got this list, we were able to call through about 200 people. And sure wow. enough, about 20 of them over the next hour or so called back and set up next step meetings and stuff like that. Yeah. So having a salesperson that even thinks like an API yeah. that knows I have a list and it's organized data. And if I can take that data in and put it somewhere where the data out is the same thing I would say. That's to do what, all day, that's what pisses off business leaders. <laughs> that's what pisses off the IT folks is because you're like, da, 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 and you figured it out in four seconds and now it's time to execute and get it done. But that drop Absolutely. cowboy, uh, does that integrate with Office 365? It, so it uh, it has a pretty good API for it and connects directly with Zapier. So since Office 365 connects with <sighs> Zapier, and, and so does that, then yes, it does. Zapier, 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 winning again. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's absolutely. a good. That's a good one. Drop Cowboy. I like that. That's and what was the other one? The other the other. Live broadcast. Live broadcast has been around longer. They're the uh, five hundred pound gorilla. And then Drop Cowboy is the one that came in just behind it. Fairly inexpensive tool. I think the entire drop for all 200 people was like 12 bucks. Not very much at all. I mean, no matter how much we try to get away from email, people still do check email. It's just that are you sending something that's useless mm -hmm. and valueless or are, you, or are you trying to differentiate yourself a bit? And and what a great question to um, for a business leader to go sit down with the marketing and sales. Like, are you guys leaving boring value NVA, no value add type emails, or can you come up with a different approach? Mm -hmm. But the key is not doing it once. Can you integrate that with the Asana project management system, the CRM system, the uh, the Drop Cowboy app, Office 365 and Zapier pumped in and to me across a team of 10, 15, 20 sales guys, that's useful. Yeah, and when we're implementing stuff like that for salespeople, we try to think of like above table and below table activities as odd as it sounds, right? It's like right now, like we're on video. So everything above the table for us is work time, right? This is the stuff we're doing. This is where my email would live. If it's going to live anywhere, is this above the table stuff. And then for everybody, there's things that happen below the table, right? That's me hiding my cell phone from my boss or, or swiping on Tinder when I should be in a meeting, right? It's all that stuff that happens below the table sure. um, that gets people's attention as well. So when a sales team is building a technology strategy, we try to make sure we're getting the prospect of the client's attention, both above the table and below the table. So is there a text campaign we can send? Is there an email campaign we can send? Because either side that they're paying attention to, we want to be able to get their attention. And so it works well when we think about the that 30-inch rule, which is about high as high as most desks are, that whatever happens above 30 or below 30 inches is two separate strategies for communicating with prospects. Above and below. Yeah, I think you just gave me the title of the of this uh, episode. What is it going to be called? <laughs> there I love you it. go. Thank I you. love it. That's great. So, so uh, what's the one thing that in this as we wrap up here? What's the one thing you wanted me to ask or forgot to ask that you that popped into your subconscious as I was talking that you're like, man, I wish Bill would ask me about that. Other than your Great Dane, how old is your Great Dane? <laughs> My Great Dane is six and a half. His name is Rorschach. He's Merle. And if he hears his name, he might come visit us here in a moment on camera. Did but, you say um, his name's R R Rorschach? Yep, just like the ink blot test. He's uh, he's Merle, so he's got the ink blots all over him like a Dalmatian. So it nice. just felt like a good name when I brought him home. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, the only thing that um, I think if there was anyone on here that I might want them to know something different about us or, or Kiba or me or anything that we do, it's um, it's the the thing that makes us very different in this space is that we don't bill by the hour for what we do. Mm-hmm. And that's different. We, we treat our clients and our services like a AAA membership. Um, someone buys an annual membership for what we do. And in that annual membership, they get an unlimited amount of support, right? They get towed if they're in a bad spot, they get roadside assist, they get all those things, right? Um, so we, we do that for people differently. And why I mentioned that isn't so people know, right? I don't care about the price or anything like that. It's because I want people to know that when you call a business or call our business in particular, um, it's push one for tech support, not push one for sales. You know, usually it's push one for sales, push two to make sure you can pay sales, push three if you meant to push one or two to get to sales, right? That's usually the phone tree. And for <laughs> us, it's push one for support and push two for account management because that's where we are, we're at. It's really it. Our slogan is we put the ass in SaaS. And, uh, and it's kick, the, kick the, ass. the AAS and SAAS, right? And, uh, and that's just it because, you know, the, the experience for most people when it comes to getting support on these tools is they have to find that special magic chat box that exists somewhere in the support site. Uh, they get to ask a question to someone typically in a foreign country who understands about half of what you're asking them and then sends you a link to their website that answers about 25% of the question, right? And so, that's, that's what most people are doing when most businesses, most people, they want to pick up the phone. They want to call someone. They want to highlight a box on their screen that they don't understand, show someone what's going on. And for us, that's what it's about. It's about over-servicing on software that's not getting serviced the way you need it to be serviced. And so if there was anything you could have asked us that I think I would have liked was that, what's that driving factor for why you're open seven days a week, 12 hours a day? It would be that. It would be because someone's got to answer the phone and we figured it might as well be us. No, I love it. I mean, and that's that's your entrepreneurial DNA. And and quite honestly, the, the folks listening, um, you know, I call them in, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. You know, not not all internal entrepreneurs want to be the tip of the spear. So that's, we'll just reserve that for the entrepreneur. But around the entrepreneur, Zuckerberg, the number 35 person <laughs> at Facebook is super happy. He's at Facebook. And um, Absolutely. I, I mean, there, he's, he's super happy. He was number 35, but, you know, Zuckerberg needed, you know, a world-class team around him. And, um, and it's, and it's, it's great. I, I, I love the, the 12 hours. Uh, you can, you know what, Kalani, I used to tell people I work half days. I just pick whatever 12 hours of the, of the day that I want. And so <laughs> well, you're in this fortunate position right now where my commute from my house to my office is the 11 feet from my living room. So, uh, so COVID's put me in this unique position where the business right now can be virtually 24 hours if it needs to be, but the 12 hours that people are open, I figured we might as well be too. So that's really yeah. what down to. But I love it that, you know, I asked you about that donkey that was on your, your logo and he said, well, that's, <laughs> that's the kick, kick the ass out of SAS. And I love that because we secure <laughs> SAS, you kick the ass out of it. And I love it because of the offense capabilities that's you bring. It. But I, listen, I had a lot of fun with this Absolutely. conversation, Kalani, and, and this is going to be um, great use for, for a lot of folks. And I'll put a, a link to what's the best way for people to uh, get in touch with you via like email, via LinkedIn, via Twitter. How would you want people to reach out to you if they have questions? I would say the easiest way to reach out to us if we have questions is to call me, um, right? That's the whole thing. It's about making sure that we can answer the phone. Uh, so 704-804-2119. Uh, goes right to my office line here at Kiva. Um, but you can also go to Kiva.com and call that number right at the top of the website, and push one to talk to tech support. And anyone here can answer any question you have about anything that you not want to know about what we do or how it works or what you're doing or how that works or anything in between. And you've got a great list of supported uh, software and applications. We'll make sure you put that up as well for people to take a look at. Kalani, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for jumping on t- today to talk to me. Pleasure as well, Bill. Have a good afternoon, man. Too.